By training, Sparing Vision President and CEO Stefan Boissel is a finance and management guy. He's got a master's degree in finance, in fact, and an MBA along with his CFA. Perhaps naturally, he did some consultancy work uh, at PwC while working towards his master's degree, then worked in venture capital for about eight years. And then in 2002, he jumped headlong into life sciences leadership roles, and he hasn't looked back. The ensuing years saw him lead Innate Pharma, Transgene, Genclis, TXL uh, as CEO, and Sangamo as EVP of Corporate Strategy, in addition to a handful of board roles. At Sparing Vision, since early 2020, Stefan is now leading a team that's developing genomic medicines for patients affected by inherited retinal diseases, and the company has made significant personnel and partnership progress since he joined the team. On today's episode of the Business of Biotech, Stefan is joining me to share his company's growth strategy, and I'm thrilled he could join us. Stefan, welcome to the show. Thank you, Matt. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's my pleasure. We're looking forward to the conversation. So uh, as I said, we're going to spend some time talking about um, the growth at Sparing Vision and some of the moves that you've made as its leader uh, to, to get the company where it is today. Um, in just a couple of short years since you since you joined, uh, but I want to get to know you a little bit better. And as I mentioned from the outset, you know you um, you, you moved uh, into um, some EVP and C level positions like pretty pretty early on after uh, leaving venture capital. Just marched right into it. Um, I'm I'm curious what inspired that. So you did you know you did your consultancy and some VC work, and then uh, and then moved into leadership of biotech. What what was the inspiration? Yeah, um, I think it's um, coming from uh, multiple factors. Uh, the main one or the first one is that I wanted to uh, be into something, you know, more entrepreneurial, uh, to be on the other side, uh, because this is where I was, you know, seeing most of the uh, exciting stuff. Uh, the next one is uh, probably a little more of a cliche, but I wanted to, to do something useful. And I'm not saying that venture capital is not useful, but uh, useful for society or be, being clever to uh, something really useful. Uh, and last but not least, uh, I met people, you know, and I met at that time some very inspiring people, and I decided to join them. And, uh, you know, without overthinking the move, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you mentioned that uh, it, it goes without saying, I think that most of the, the leaders of biopharma companies that I speak to, when I ask them a similar question, what inspires you to do what you do? You know, everybody says, because I, I have a, you know, a passion for, for helping people. I want to help people. And it's never cliche. Like I understand where you, you might, you know, you might draw the assumption like, oh, this is cliche. Everybody says that, but it, to me, it, just, it, it never is. So don't, don't feel bad about it. I mean, that's uh I mean, it, I, I, I refuse to accept that that could pot even potentially be cliche. Uh, I'm with you. Yeah, yeah. Um, so as I mentioned, your education is not in biology, not in, uh, in, in pharma for that matter, or chemistry. Um, so I'm, I'm curious about uh, how your education sort of plays into the management style that you've developed over the years. You know, you've got this master's in finance from, and I'll butcher the name, you, I'll just say the University of Paris, Dauphine. Yeah, I'll let you say it. Pretty well. <laughs> and an MBA from the University of Chicago Booth School of Business. How do those, how does that sort of uh, training, professional training, um, inform your management style? Well, that's a tough one. Uh, it's clearly uh, not making my life easy in this world where everything is, you know, technical. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And I need sophisticated, so I probably have to work uh, a little more than, than uh, some of my peers on certain of the topics. But the reality is that I, 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 I see myself as a, as a conductor of an orchestra, you know, uh, and uh, uh, my job is mostly about having a strategic vision, and you don't need to be a scientist to do that, uh, to clearly understand my competitive environment to uh, recruit the right people, uh, so staff well, and to make sure, uh, coming back to my earlier comment uh, on being a conductor of an orchestra, that the, the person that I'm recruiting are uh, all experts 
obviously in what they are doing, but are definitely better expert than I am in everything they are doing. Mm-hmm. You know, so um, yeah, it's about being able to develop a strategic vision, uh, being able to uh, you know anticipate what will come next, uh, being able to uh, recruit the right people and have them to uh, play the right the right partition to play as a team, and um, yeah, to uh, sometimes also, and, and this is relating to uh, more specifically your question, you know, in, 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 you know, going through an MBA, you learn a lot of stuff and uh, 20 or 25 years af- after that, I'm not sure you remember all of them, <laughs> but if there is one that I can remember is all the uh, courses I had on, on, you know, game theory and uh, on the fact that you live in a world where there is um, a lot of uh, asymmetry in information. When you do, uh, you know, you negotiate a deal, for example, mm-hmm. uh, or you speak with investors, and um, you know they, they have some expectation. We have some expectation, and you have to uh, find the right, you know, sweet spot, which is going to uh, be where the expectation of both parties are going to meet. And this is, uh, yeah, uh, pretty much a game that you uh, kind of learn in a, in an MBA class. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. And that's a, that's a great segue into the next question I had for you, because as uh, a, a CEO, you're also uh, a chief um, fund, fundraising <laughs> officer in many senses, right? You're the, you're the, the, the face of the program and the, and the lead fundraiser. And you, you mentioned, you just mentioned this, um, you know, negotiation and expectations around uh, in, in investor uh, expectations. That is, um, you know, I've, I've talked with a lot of experts in, in, in that space who say those expectations are, are changing. You know, there's a lot going on right now in the markets. You know, uh, here we are, the, the, the tightening private, private equity market uh, is, is, is kind of in, in impacting everyone. Um, the XBI is down, I think, 50% over the last six months. Um, the S&P Biotech Select is down like 34% over the last six months. So money, you know, it's all to say money's not easy to come by right now. Um, do you, given that background and, and we're going to get to the sparing vision story here in a minute, but I'm, I'm just intrigued, <laughs> it's intrigued to pick your brain about your, your, your finance and, and management background. So g- given that finance and management background, do you, do you feel like perhaps in a, in a tightening, uh, capital markets, uh, environment, you have, uh, an advantage, maybe a, a leg up, uh, given that you've, you've kind of got that pedigree. I, I, I don't think so. Uh, uh, if there is anything is that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm educated to anticipate. And so um, when the market started to change, uh, on my market, I mean, the uh, US, you know, uh, public equity market for biotech, uh, six months ago, and my firm is private. But, but I knew that uh, if the market was going to continue to be you know, uh, worsening. At one point, it will you know affect the the, the private private equity business as well, the, the private equity market, uh, and, and this is the market you know I'm taking the money from. So uh, we, we we started to discuss with the board um, uh, as you know uh, we are very likely going to work on the Series B uh, uh, soon, so the next round of financing. Um, you know, how do we look at investor outreach? Are we going to uh, focus, continue to focus on uh, investors that were really making the market in 2021? Or do we anticipate that there will be a change in investor focus? And so we pivot to a, a different category of investors. So, and, and I'm certainly not the only one thinking this way, but this is clearly where my, my uh, education uh, and, and you know, being strategic, uh, being able to anticipate, uh, understanding the markets. This is clearly where my education is helping. Um, mm-hmm. And and uh, I mean, what what's going on nowadays with all the uncertainty in the market is kind of proving me uh, right. Unfortunately. Yeah. 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 And maybe I, I probably got ahead of myself a little bit going right into the investment strategy. I want to give you an opportunity to talk about sparing vision. I, I, I want to hear the, the uh, origin story there and how you came to be its president and CEO. So uh, I believe the company was founded in 16 and you joined again, uh, you joined in 2020 as perhaps chairman before taking on the CEO role 
I don't know. Yeah, yeah so I was, um, uh, so the company indeed was started in 2016 as a spin off from the Institut de la Vision in Paris, France. And uh, I was appointed chairman of the board, non executive chairman, in uh, early 2020. I was uh, still in San Francisco at that time with, uh, with Sangamo. And then um, I was involved uh, in 2020 uh, in the fundraising process um, as, as a non executive chairman, but I was uh, um, very often attending you know, meetings uh, with investors uh, on you know, trying to be educated to the story and being able to uh, speak to the story. And so uh, when I decided to uh, move back to Europe uh, on the back of COVID uh, in the spring and summer of 2020, as we were going to close the Series A, um, you know, very naturally, I moved to a more you know, executive role at, uh, at Sparing Vision. And so I kept, for the time being, my um, hat, so to speak, as a chairman. And on top of that, I was appointed in the fall of uh, 2020, um, as uh, again, when we closed the Series A and when I was moving back to Europe, uh, CEO as well. So I'm currently chairman and CEO of the, of the company. But it was not done you know, overnight, it was done in the, uh, Two different step on on the back of uh, a financing catalyst. Sure. Okay. So t- tell us about uh, what what the company was when you came uh, at, when you joined it as chairman, and then during that tra- transition to CEO. Um, I mean, were, were you like at the early early stage, like maybe some scientific founders, and really no kind of kind of corporate infrastructure just yet? Uh, what 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 did the set the scene for us when when Stefan yeah. Russell joined the joined the group? Yeah, so, so um, it was um, uh, already a company, and it had been so for four years, because as I said, it was started in 2016. Uh, but it was a single asset company uh, managed at that time more or less like an extension of the academic lab. It was uh, spun up from a, a few years before. And so uh, there were like, you know, six or seven employees, uh, very little infrastructure, uh, very little process. And uh, again, all eggs are on the same, uh, in the same basket mm-hmm. uh, with one, uh, one single asset, a very technical asset because this is, I mean, uh, our lead asset at that time, which is still our lead asset today. We have more assets, so we will be speaking to it, uh, but it's still our lead asset, uh, but it's a very complex uh, uh, novel biology. And uh, definitely the company at that time, uh, and, and this is the feedback we were receiving from uh, you know, the board members, the, 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 the incoming investors, on the staff uh, itself. Uh, we needed to move to a more uh, you know, professional uh, and pharma-like kind of, uh, kind of development. I mean, this is uh, gene therapy and, again, a very sophisticated biology. And so, uh, yeah, this is what I found when I, when, I, when I came on board. No surprise, I, I knew what I was going to find. Uh, but we definitely uh, decided to, uh, you know, accelerate uh, uh, on the development of the lead asset, but also to add, you know, new assets uh, to the to the portfolio. And uh, this is the mandate that was given to me when I joined, and, and what I asked when I joined, because I didn't want to, uh, uh, you know, uh, work uh, on a single asset, you know, company on a binary play. I've, I've been through it before, and I know how it can hurt the day you fail with your lead asset. So I definitely wanted to uh, broaden the portfolio and uh, I had a very uh, clear uh, vision as to what I wanted uh, uh, the company to do. And and, uh, hopefully I had the strong support from the board to do it and from the incoming investors to do it, so. Yeah, was there, um, uh, this is just a a real real general question out of my curiosity. Was there a, uh, so when you joined the company and you you took a good look around, Got, got a feel for where the company was and knew where you wanted to take it. Um, having served as a CEO of multiple other biotechs, uh, CEO or, or deputy CEO of multiple other biotechs, was there anything that you looked, you, you know, looking down the, 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 the road for Sparing Vision, was there anything that, that you determined you wanted to do that you perhaps hadn't done before? Like, was, was there an element of the, of the position that was going to um, be new? to you and yeah. challenges you hadn't seen before. Yeah, that's, that's a very good uh, uh, point. Uh, what was uh, new to me was the fact that, um, uh, of course, with the support of the board on, on the investors, um, I had a clear mandate uh, 
to uh, uh, you know build a pipeline. And in my previous experience, um, I, I had more to deal with uh, something that was existing and that sometimes need to be restructured uh, or, or uh, sometimes that need to be uh, changed. But it was uh, up until now for me, mostly about fixing stuff, uh, uh, much more so than uh, about creating stuff. You know? mm -hmm. And so that was uh, really what uh, trigger my uh, interest to join in a, in a more executive role. And of course, the, the science was, I mean, is super exciting. Uh, the scientific founder of the company, uh, including Jose Sahel, uh, are really well-known uh, KOL in, in this space. Uh, uh, they have already started many, many companies, like 10 or 12 when it comes to Jose Sahel. And uh, his name, when you read about our space, is uh, everywhere across the scientific literature. So, uh, you know, that kind of opportunity where you have a solid science, a very strong uh, scientific foundation, and, and, uh, and, and some money to deliver on a mandate, which is to build something aggressively, mm -hmm. uh, is, um, was new to me and was certainly uh, unique for Europe. I mean, this is the kind of stuff that you see a lot in the US, but in Europe until recently, uh, uh, you know, it was uh, probably, uh, uh, you know, very challenging to find this kind of story because uh, the uh, investment community was uh, maybe a little shy when it comes to expanding aggressively, um, you know, from, from, such, from such kind of uh, scientific foundation. Yeah. More recently, I mean, you know, current uh, current dampening of, of the investment community, uh, notwithstanding. More, more recently, I've seen I've seen a, a few reports that um, peg uh, cell and gene therapy growth in in the UK as as uh, running neck and neck, and maybe in some cases, you know, uh, um, out, outpacing the the pace here in the US. So it, it sounds like you you kind of you you got on that uh, at least again current situation notwithstanding you got on the on the train at the right time yeah no and, and uh, you know fortunately uh, hopefully uh, things are changing rapidly in europe mm -hmm. um, and, and and i mean the uk is is, is is not exactly continental europe for some reason and i don't have the uh, explanation to, to this but uh, um, uh, 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 investors um, you know, from the US uh, have, uh, I mean, are investing in, in the UK uh, and, and UK companies are behaving uh, like US companies much more so than, uh, you know, uh, continental European companies. I mean, you see far less American money coming into uh, continental Europe and far less continental companies behaving like, like US companies. So, I mean, uh, the UK and, 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 and the US are, um, you know, just two different versions of the same thing. Uh, when it yeah. comes to continental Europe, it's it's uh, it's it's a different story, and it's uh, until recently it was much more difficult to attract, uh, you know, money and talent um, to a new European venture. And again, this is changing, uh, mostly because the mentality is changing. Uh, the mentality is changing across the board. I mean, uh, you know, uh, leadership teams, uh, board members, um, and investors as well. Uh, are becoming uh, much more aggressive and much more, you know, ambitious. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is one of the reasons why, again, I, I've decided to uh, relocate back in Europe uh, because I, I saw that uh, the environment was was kind of changing. Yeah. yeah. Good. Good. Yeah. And we're gonna. I'm. I'm gonna ask you about some of the. Uh, to your point, uh, personnel decisions you made recently here shortly. But first, I want to talk a little bit about your deal with Intelia. You you were only there uh, for, for, I think, a little under a year as president and CEO when, or maybe a little more than a year, when you established a partnership with the, with Intelia, which I believe was last fall. Yeah. Um, so, so I want to, I want to learn a little bit about that. What was the, why, why did you, why did you seek that partnership in the first place? So uh, good question. The, uh, the, the, the mandate, uh, to uh, expand the portfolio that I had, that I had when I joined the company, was uh, around three um, strategic pillars. Uh, the first one uh, is the legacy pillar, uh, which is the uh, gene therapy pillar, with uh, something which is totally unique in the sense that 
uh, in this pillar, we are only developing what we call a mutation agnostic gene therapy product. Unlike all our peers, which are targeting uh, a specific mutation, like, like Luxterna, for example, targeting RP65. Um, we are developing in this pillar a product, gene therapy product, uh, that uh, will work, uh, if they work, independently of the causative mutation of the disease, uh, which uh, give them a few uh, benefits or advantages compared to, again, what is being done in the space. Uh, one of them being that theoretically, you don't need to uh, know the genetic background of the person to treat that person affected by a disease. Mm -hmm. uh, but very importantly, for more or less the same cost of development, you have access to a huge you know, uh, commercial potential. So the return on investment um, is expected to be far superior than, again, uh, with any uh, other product de developed in this space. And next to this uh, pillar, uh, I had the uh, idea, which was uh, shared uh, with, the, with the board, to develop two additional pillars, uh, synergistic, and we can speak to the synergies. The first one was based on uh, genome editing. And, uh, remember, this is the space I was coming from. I was uh, previously at Sangamo in San Francisco, which was one of the first you know, genome editing companies uh, uh, started uh, way before CRISPR, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, uh, uh, and, and then the last pillar that we can speak at the end, uh, which was, uh, which is in vivo reprogramming. But so coming back to your question, uh, when I joined and I was given this mandate to expand the, the, the portfolio across those uh, three pillars, very happily, uh, I, I put together a few slides describing the, uh, uh, you know, ideal, uh, a strategic alliance in the space of genome editing because we didn't have the technology. And with uh, our lawyers, we, we put together a, 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 you know, a term sheet proposal and, and, and I went on the road, well, on the road. It was not exactly on the road because at that time we were not able to travel, but I went on, uh, on, on speak to uh, maybe not all, but most of the uh, you know, genome uh, editing players in the space and um, uh, started you know, confidential discussion with a few of them. And, uh, um, you know, Intelia was among, among those and very rapidly uh, when they, um, you know, showed some traction for the deal I was, uh, we were proposing, um, I realized, oh my gosh, this is, you know, unexpected and, um, you know, this is the best possible partner for us. And so um, very rapidly we focused the discussion on one player that was Intelia. And we, um, we, we, we signed a term sheet in the spring and um, then the, not in the spring, excuse me, in the summer, and then we signed the deal in, uh, in, uh, in the fall of uh, 2021. And this is um, a super exciting opportunity for us. Um, and I hope that, uh, you know, we will uh, deliver the, uh, the value that uh, uh, Intelia is expecting us to, to deliver in this space. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that. You, you, you hinted at, uh, you know, sort of unorthodox or non-traditional uh, approach, given the fact that you couldn't necessarily travel or go on, go on a roadshow, so to speak. So tell, tell me, give me some color on the process of, of pitching and, and, and working out the, uh, the deal with Intelia, you know, perhaps in a remote um, yeah. environment. Yeah, well, you know, uh, this is um, what... What happened with, with this deal is, is more or less what has happened with you know, financing over the last two years. You know, we've closed the Series A without you know, meeting in person uh, any of the investors that, that you know, have participated to the Series A. So uh, in terms of the process with uh, you know, Intelia, we started to, uh, uh, again, to discuss with a, a few parties in the space by you know, uh, connecting uh, through the network. Um, and I'm not going to be very specific for obvious reason. Uh, you know, you send your you send your, your your pitch. You see whether you have some traction. When you have some traction, you sign a CDA. Uh, when the CDA is signed, you give more color to the project. Um, you start to uh, discuss the uh, um, you know the possible targets. Um, you start to discuss uh, those, the possible product concept to go after those targets based on the. You know, toolbox that you that the partner in this case Intelia is going to give you access to, and then you start to discuss in parallel what the the, the deal terms could be, and uh, if you can you know uh, um, have converging interests in terms of the target you are looking for, in terms of the product concept or the technologies you want to use, 
And then in terms of the uh, deal terms, you know, progressively, uh, it's not quick, okay? It's not very rapid, it takes months, okay? Let's say three to, three to four months to come to, uh, to come to an understanding as to what a possible, uh, you know, strategic alliance will look like, you know? And then uh, once you have this high level understanding or agreement, you start to draft a term sheet and that, that will take, you know, two to three months. Uh, to negotiate because this is where the key terms are, uh, you know, inked. Uh, and then when the, the term sheet is signed, then the, uh, you know, lawyers are entering the room. And this is where suddenly the deal is out of control, you know, because you are starting to discuss some very specific, very technical, uh, uh, you know, uh, section of the agreement that, uh, um, I mean, for most, most of the clauses will, you know, never come to, uh, to um, into play, <laughs> hopefully. But, but are very necessary uh, for, the, uh, for the agreement to be signed. And so you spend a lot of time, you know, discussing with uh, your future partner, uh, your lawyers, their lawyers, your board, uh, and uh, making sure that you align, you know, everyone to uh, an agreement which will, uh, you know, be, uh, you know, 150 or 200 pages long agreement that will govern the life of the uh, alliance, possibly for, you know, excuse me, 10, 15 or 20 years. Mm -hmm. uh, or more if you are very successful so that's that's the journey from the beginning to the uh, to the end and of course uh, i will uh, uh, spare you all the details but uh, mm -hmm. it's a lot of uh, it's a lot of work it's sometimes a lot of fun because you are dealing with uh, very smart people you know on, on all sides um, mm -hmm. and it's uh, sometimes uh, stressful but at the end of the day uh, it's uh, rewarding so it's uh, definitely worth the uh, the journey when you're striving to excel in a new arena, the best guides are the ones already doing it well. The business of biotech brings those voices forward to help new and emerging biopharmas turn their innovations, like mRNA and cell and gene therapies, into clinical realities. Tune in and subscribe for insights on hiring, regulatory, and other need-to-know topics for biopharma leaders. The podcast is brought to you in collaboration with Cytiva. Check out their resources at cytiva.com backslash emerging biotech. That's C-Y-T-I-V-A dot com backslash emerging biotech. Yeah. What's your, uh, I'm going to ask you a two-part question about that, just to, just to dig into that experience a little bit more. So two-part question. One, what, um, if you had to put your finger on a couple of keys to success in, a, in, in, in orchestrating of a partnership like this, what what would those keys be, perhaps? And the second part of the question, very closely related, would be um, what what advice would you give young biotech leaders who are endeavoring to um, to do the same thing to to create a partnership with a with a organization like Intelia? Yeah, good. Uh, uh, the, the second question is is uh, is, is tricky. I I'm not sure I'm, I'm the best person to give um, you know lessons to people or, or to, uh, <laughs> to you know to guide people. But but when it comes to the first one, um, uh, the first and foremost, have a very clear uh, vision as to what the end game uh, should be for you. You know, um, so what are you looking for? What what do you want out of the deal? Okay, uh, and it's uh, sometimes easier said than done, okay? Because it's uh, multi-parametric and you have multi-party, I mean, uh, numerous parties, uh, you know, involved in, in such, uh, such kind of deal. Uh, the second is that uh, be, uh, be realistic, don't be naive and be reasonable about uh, the, uh, you know, the, um, the, the deal itself, okay? And uh, coming back to the, uh, preliminary discussion we had on game theory and asymmetry of information. You know, you don't know what are the, the limits or what is the mandate or the exact mandate of the other party, okay? Uh, so uh, be, uh, yeah, don't be naive. Try to understand where they are going to. And, and again, be reasonable, okay? Because uh, in our case, and this is very important to bear in mind, we were the tiny company uh, out of France going after you know, the technology of a giant uh, based in the US uh, with a, a, a technology, you know, proven in the clinic. 
at that time a 10 billion plus you know market cap and we came to uh, sit down with them out of nowhere they were not expecting us you know so uh, we were not exactly in a position of threat and so i always uh, you know uh, kept in mind that uh, of course i was going to defend you know the interest of my company but uh, I, 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 it was crucial for me to stay always reasonable you know and understand again try to understand as much as i can as we can what uh, mandate was given to the um, to the other party yeah. and the last the last element um, uh, which uh, sometimes uh, you know is easy to forget is that uh, we are not the um, only you know uh, person in the room we have a board we have investors we have uh, staff uh, and, and other parties that we always need to align uh, as to um, you know what's going on so uh, inform you know align and make sure when uh, you discuss with your counterpart uh, you know all parties within your own group is uh, again totally uh, aligned and informed so as to uh, avoid any you know bad surprise at the end yeah yeah cool um let, let's so let, let's talk results a little bit i mean from the outset you said you know uh, mission mission number one was expand the pipeline create create some create some products um so so how i guess give us give us an update since uh, and i know it's early but how is how is the uh partnership um with intelia facilitated that or, or yeah. you know, fueled fueled that so well you know prior to the strategic alliance with intelia in 2021 in the in the spring of 2021 we have uh, announced the acquisition of a, a, a small startup company um, uh, another spin-off from the institute la vision uh, called gamut uh, which uh, was starting the development of uh, a product very synergistic with with our lead, you know, gene therapy product. So uh, that uh, acquisition gave us access to uh, another gene therapy product. Uh, and then uh, with the combination of the uh, product, uh, you know, that uh, we bought from this uh, company on our lead product, we, we are uh, starting the development of a third product. So my point is that prior to Intelia, we had already expanded the portfolio from one product to uh, three products. Mm -hmm. in the same pillar and then intelia is uh, constitutive i mean the deal with intelia is constitutive of the second pillar the genome editing pillar and the deal is structured in such a way that we can develop uh, up to three uh, products uh, out of a basket of uh, targets that are exclusively reserved to us by, by intelia for a certain period of time mm -hmm. so you know pro forma of that deal we have moved in 14 months from being a single product company to a product, uh, to a company, excuse me, with a portfolio of up to six products. Mm -hmm. The one legacy product, two that uh, we uh, are developing through the acquisition of uh, Gamut, and then up to three that we will be developing with uh, Intelia. And um, we are currently working on the uh, other opportunities to further you know, expand the portfolio in the last pillar, which is uh, in vivo programming. So um, yeah, we are just delivering on the strategic plan that uh, we agreed upon with, uh, with the board on the, on the incoming investors when I joined as CEO in, uh, in September of 2020. Yeah, progress being made on the, on the mandate. Uh, I yeah, like ab it. Absolutely. Yeah. N now the, the mandate itself, uh, the, the candidates, the product uh, are, are nothing if not led and shepherded by a, a good a good team of uh you know as my friend alan shaw calls them jockeys right you don't bet on the you don't bet on the horse you bet on the jockey uh so let's talk about that because you you know and i want to talk about the strategy behind this you've uh since you came on board you've, you've built out your team a bit last spring you hired dr daniel chung as chief medical officer over the winter you made some key appointments including uh bringing dr Mehdi gosmi on board as chief operating officer um, why, why were these, tell us about those hires, why, why they were strategic times to bolster the leadership uh, in the C-suite? Yeah, so um, um, uh, again, this is cliche, <laughs> but the, the, in what we are doing, the team is everything. I mean, uh, you, you have a few uh, 
you know, pillars or foundation to what you are doing. Of course, good science, uh, good, you know, patent or IP portfolio. Uh, but at the end of the day, if you have a good science, a good IP portfolio, a nice factory, a beautiful lab, but you don't have anyone to, uh, you know, run those operations, you are nothing. So, um, uh, you know, very rapidly when, when, I, when I joined, uh, and remember that there was no, uh, you know, management team per se, um, we, uh, we, with the board, we've, we've aligned uh, as to uh, what the uh, ideal team was going to look like. And so I just went and, and, and looked for the best, the best, um, the, the best possible, you know, person in my field. So Dan, that uh, you were referring to before, before joining us in uh, early 2021, uh, uh, had been with uh, Spark uh, for the last uh, seven years, developing and launching Luxtoma, which uh, to date is still the only, uh, you know, gene therapy product approved, uh, you know, in the space of ophthalmology, um, in in now more than 40 countries, by the way, and that was totally instrumental in the development and the launch of the brand. And, 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 and prior to that, he, he was uh, involved in the same story at UPenn on, on, on shop, uh, your neighbors, by the way. And so he has been following the story from the beginning, like 20 years of Dan's life has been on, on the product, which is now a marketed product. Yeah. So for us, being new to the field, uh, uh, you know, having him as chief medical officer is just a blessing, you know, and, and by the way, it took me 12 months of discussion and negotiation with him to, to have it. But well, I, I, I'm, I'm glad you I'm glad you pointed that out, Stefan, because I, uh, you know, when I, when I think about this, you know, his pedigree speak, speaks for itself I mean, yeah. he's an illustrious career, um, which is why I wanted to talk about him. Um, but you don't just go out and tap him on the shoulder and say, hey, I, I'm oh. another, you know, I'm another biopharma startup and I'd kind of like you to come work for me. Um so yeah, you t- tell us about that 12 months of, of, of discussion. It's not, you know, and, and I know how it works. It's not just about the money. It's about the project. It's about what you're doing. Yeah. It's about who you're working with. Tell us a little bit about how that, you know, that recruiting process worked. So the good thing is that uh, Dan had been exposed to uh, our lead asset uh, some time ago when he was at uh, UPenn because the biology I'm working on, I mean, we are working on, it's not exactly a new biology. Uh, it has been developed in, the, in a few academic labs in the, in the US and in Europe over the last 15 to 20 years. And so Dan knew uh, the lead uh, asset. But at that time, we had only this asset. Uh, you know, the expansion had not started yet. I mean, it was the plan, but it was not uh, exactly concrete. So uh, the fact that Dan knew the biology we were working on with our lead asset clearly helped. Uh, and then um, I, I spent a lot of time, you know, with, with him explaining where I wanted to go, where I wanted the company to go. He spent a lot of time discussing also with our scientific founder. Uh, he spent a lot of time discussing with the board. And um, I think we were lucky enough uh, to find him at the time where uh, he also was at the end of the exciting stuff, probably for him at Spa. And so he was looking for something new, or he was going to look for something new. What took us so long is that uh, Dan, on top of being a, 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 an incredibly talented CMO, is a very loyal person. And, and so he wanted to stay with his team, and he wanted to uh, go uh, uh, up to a certain you know, point or milestone with his project. And uh, so he was not ready to, uh, to move you know, very, uh, very rapidly. Yeah. And so I had to be patient. I had to, uh, but but I knew I knew he was going to be the one. You know, like when you meet your wife, you you, you know, or your or your partner, your loved one, you know, she she or he is going to be the one. And so I I, I was just patient and I waited for the right time. And then when it was the right time, I you just jumped on it <laughs> <laughs> and it joined us. You know, and and same for I mean, you mentioned Medi, so Medi uh, is also a perfect fit for us. He joined us as. Uh, Chief Operating Officer, he was previously um, at, uh, at uh, you know, Adveron, President and CSO. Uh, he's a veteran in our space, um, uh, uh, being, you know, a gene therapy expert. And for the last uh, few years, having been involved, uh, you know, with uh, Adveron, where he was last, uh, um, you know, a board member. And, uh, you know, very talented, very experienced, uh, seasoned executive in our space. 
And so, you know, I can tell you the same about our CTO based in Boston. I can tell you the same about uh, the person in charge of, uh, you know, non-clinical development who is based in San Francisco. So clearly, uh, when uh, I had to, uh, to build that team, I decided to go uh, and find the talents where they are and not try to pressure them to come over to work in France. You know, that was not the, uh, the, uh, the most important, let's say, uh, factor for me mm. recruiting these people. The most important factor was, okay, uh, are they the best in what they are doing? You know, and this is what uh, really guided me. Yeah. So there's an important lesson in there, uh, I think, around um, balancing uh, the desire for specific talent and time. Because part of my question for you about these hires was like, you know, oftentimes I have discussions like, when's the appropriate time to bring on a chief regulatory officer? Obviously, when you're, you know, preclinical, but heading in that direction. When's the appropriate time to bring on a chief financial or or operating or, or medical is a big one, right? Now, normally, there's sort of this, you know, accepted acceptable window of, of, of time in which okay we you know, we're going to need a, a chief medical officer um when you when you're looking at a, a you know potentially 12 month recruiting effort as was the case with dr chung uh, you got to plan for that right like you don't want to find yourself in a position where like you know you 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 made it clear he was your guy you don't want to find yourself in a position where your need for a cmo any CMO is stronger than your desire for, for Dr. Chung. So tell us a little bit about, just give me some insight, I guess, on, on balancing yeah. planning for the, those, those important uh, key hires well in advance, perhaps of the time when you absolutely need that position. Well, that, 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 that's exactly the point, you know, who could them in advance and uh, clearly I didn't need at that time when I started the search, uh, a CMO of the pedigree of that, okay? But I knew that the time we, we was going to come, you know? Yeah. And, and uh, I, we, we try to always recruit ahead of time, okay? And not recruit when you need the people because, uh, uh, you know, this is, uh, I mean, most likely you are not going to uh, have the, the, the time to, to really select the person you want to work with. That, that's the reality of our business. Yeah. And so anticipate and even... Uh, you know, if, to, if you have to pay, uh, you know, a, an expert, being a medical expert, being a, a, you know, a tech up expert, manufacturing expert, being a finance expert, you know, six or nine months uh, to do, you know, very little work compared to when uh, you will really uh, need that person. That's okay. That, that's, you know, part of the game. That's the name of the game. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, good. Yeah. Congratulations on those hires. It is a, a excellent team. And, um, you know, hopefully to the, I guess the other uh, dynamic of, of putting a team like that together that occurs to me specific to your situation is, you know, as you said, as a, as a, as a pioneering uh, emerging uh, biopharma in France, perhaps, um, you know, you're not seeing the same access to the investment community and, 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 um, and, and the private equity markets that, those in the UK and the, and the US are, um, when you build a team of internationally recognized people and, and, and put your C-suite together that way, that's got to, you know, that, that, that's got to increase your appeal out there in the of finance course. community. It's got to, right? Of course, of course. It's, uh, it's uh, as you say, in the US, uh, uh, a way to uh, kill two birds with one stone. <laughs> you know, you, you, you bring some uh, fantastic expertise to your team and then you uh, increase your level of, uh, you know, attractiveness for, you know, business partners, for, for investors. That, that's, again, that's the name of the game. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, well, you know, I, I'm, uh, we're, we're running short on time here, <laughs> Stefan. I, I, I think I could, I could talk to you about this, the strategy stuff all day, but I want to give you an opportunity to talk about your pipeline and, and progress there and your therapeutic candidates. We haven't even really talked about the indications you're pursuing. So let's talk about that a little bit before we wrap things up. Um, what, what are your therapy? Well, you did reference your therapeutic candidates, but let's talk about the indications uh, that they aim to, to address and specifically what those market opportunities and patient populations might look like. Sure. So the, uh, the, the, the primary focus uh, across the whole portfolio uh, is what we call inherited retinal disease. Okay. And specifically for the first two products, 
uh, it's a, a, a disease which is called retinitis pigmentosa, okay, which is an inherited disease again, uh, caused by 70 or 80 different genes uh, as, of, as of today. Right? And, 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 and we are still counting, by the way, because we are discovering genes, you know, mm -hmm. um, not all the time, but, but, but kind of uh, you know, often. Uh, so that's the primary focus. And um, the, the, the pattern of the disease, uh, if this is your question, is um, the, the, the following. You have some very early onset, like Lux Turner, for example, is addressing a very uh, early onset uh, um, nature, or, or let's say uh, part of, the, of this disease with a very specific mutation. But for most of the patient, the, the, the vast majority, it's a very, uh, slowly progressive disease and uh, you uh, are diagnosed uh, late like in your 20 or you know, 25 mm -hmm. uh, because you start to uh, bump into things and uh, because you, you you start to be clumsy in a way um, and uh, your your vision uh, which uh, um, is at the beginning altered you know, at night or your peripheral vision, your central vision is starting to be altered and your, your day vision is starting to be altered. And this is due to the following phenomenon. You have two kinds of photoreceptors, okay, in your retina. You have the rods and the cones. Um, uh, the rods are the photoreceptors, the most affected by mutation. And they are responsible, the rods, for peripheral vision and night vision. So when your rods are affected by a mutation, they die. Okay, let's be uh, simplistic. But you don't realize that you are losing your rods because we live in a you know, lighty environment. You know? mm -hmm. And uh, because you use your central vision for you know, looking at me as, as we speak or for reading. Okay? Mm -hmm. So uh, unless you are, again, uh, affected by a very early onset kind of mutation with a very rapid uh, degeneration or a lack of a specific gene, uh, you realize that uh, you are affected by this pathology. Uh, when your uh, rod compartment is gone and your cones are started to be affected. And this is the old theory about the, the lead asset is that the, the, the cones will die because the rods are dead. Okay, and because the rods are responsible for the supply to the cause of a neuroprotective you know, factor. So to come back to the, uh, the diagnostic, you are in your 20 or 25, you have lost your rods and you start to realize that you have a problem because not only you have lost your rods, but you start to lose your code. So your central vision is affected, your visual acuity is affected. You go to your physician, you are diagnosed unfortunately for RP, there is nothing for you uh, until very, very late stage where you have access to transplantation, to cell therapy product, to what we call uh, uh, optogenetics. Mm -hmm. uh, but in this very late stage of the disease, most likely you will be able to recoup a fraction of what you had before. So there is a long period of time, let's say between your 20 and your 40 or 50s, because it takes a lot of time for uh, your cones department to, uh, or compartment, excuse me, to disappear, mm -hmm. during which you are going to you know, uh, uh, year after year, lose progressively your vision, which is going to be tunneling until you are in complete darkness. So this is retinitis pigmentosa. Horrible disease, uh, no treatment today, uh, unless, again, you, are, uh, you have access to Luxtoma or you are at the very end and you have access to some kind of regenerative, you know, therapy, which again is not going to give you back what you had before. And uh, to your question on, uh, you know, the, the, the prevalence of that disease, uh, it's something like 100,000, you know, patients in the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, and probably 150 to 200 uh, in Europe and globally like 2 million because it's a, a, a very prevalent disease uh, in, uh, in Asia as well. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, not exactly a rare disease, uh, but uh, it's a disease for which the uh, unmet medical need, as, as we speak, is just enormous. And the Luxturna that we were referring to before is only going to treat a tiny fraction of the population because they will treat, uh, it will treat, excuse me, only patients affected by uh, a mutation called RP65, which is like, you know, 2 to 2.5% of the patient. 
Okay. Yeah. The advantage of what we are doing is that, as I said to you in the introduction, we are mutation agnostic. So if our biology works in human as it is working in animals, we could potentially, you know, address the whole, you know, population. Yeah, yeah. And and should that come to pass? And I know it's early. It's it's uh, you know I. I I, I, it's a, it's a tricky thing asking uh, the leader of a biopharma company to look through the crystal ball or put the, you know, fo- feature facing cap on. Uh, but, but, but should that come to pass? What, what, uh, give me an, uh, give me an idea of what the manufacturing paradigm might look like. What might the necessity uh, of, of manufacturing look like to meet that patient population? Well, it's, uh, it's gene therapy. It's not cell therapy. So it's uh, what we call off the shelf. So as long as you have a manufacturing process, um, you, you're, you're good to go. I mean, uh, you're not talking about, you know, 10, 20, 30 million of doses, you know? So uh, gene therapy, especially if you have a manufacturing center in the US and one in Europe, and then one in, uh, in, in Asia, for example, you will have no problem to supply, um, you know, the market. You know? Uh, again, as long as you have uh, developed a proper, uh, manufacturing process. The key is in the process. You know, manufacturing itself, as soon as you have a process, which is a robust, you know, uh, process, um, um, you know, you, you, you're, you're good to go. Mm-hmm. Will you, um, what, what, is that process something you're developing to, given the, I guess, smaller, r- relatively smaller volumes, is that process something you're developing to handle in-house or will you, will you outsource that? So this is something that uh, we are currently uh, pivoting to as well. Uh, until uh, I joined, everything was outsourced, mm-hmm. uh, including process development. And uh, this is something that we are, again, slowly uh, and progressively going to uh, internalize because this is uh, just too critical for a gene therapy play to be not necessarily in control of manufacturing, although when you are at the later stage, it's very important to be in control of manufacturing, but at least to be in control of um, uh, PD, process development. Because again, there is a lot of value in, uh, in, uh, in, um, in the process and also uh, uh, immediate value. But if you don't do the development right, uh, things can haunt you forever. Yeah. You know? So you have to uh, uh, over-invest, like you over-invest in people, never underinvest in manufacturing when you are in the gene therapy space. Yeah. Yeah. Is the motivation for that uh, more around whenever I talk with, uh, with execs who make outsourcing decisions or, or insourcing decisions, there's often conversation around what motivates those decisions. Sometimes it's control, manufacturing control. Sometimes it's supply control, uh, timelines, you know, we don't want to be burdened by, uh, by, by our outsourcing partner. It sounds to me like uh, intellect is is a big part of your uh, your rationale for wanting to keep this in house. So it's IP, um, so intellectual property, uh, people, because the the world is such that there is a significant turnover of staff, you know, at CMOs, and it's something that every time you have, you know, a scientist in a lab leaving, you have to train these people and start all over again. Okay. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then it comes to uh, uh, indeed flexibility, having access to the, to the factory or to the lab when you, when you need to have access to, um, you know, you don't have to wait for nine, 12 months sometimes, which is what we are seeing nowadays. Yeah. Uh, and then costs, I mean, the, the cost of uh, uh, CMO activities uh, have gone to the roof over the last you know, five years because there is scarcity in, uh, in supply. You know, and, and you saw that, by the way, in the value of the uh, C, uh, CMO and CDMO assets that have gone to the roof. You know, many acquisitions have been done in this space at, at prices which, uh, you know, 10 years ago were, were totally crazy. Or, you know, you were not expecting those kind of services to, uh, you know, uh, attract those, those, those kind of pricing. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, th- those are the, the four main criteria when it, when it comes to deciding, uh, you know, uh, about uh, internalizing um, you know, you know, PD on, on manufacturing. Yeah. Excellent. Well, you're, you're in luck. My producer's giving me the wrap it up sign. So I've got one last, one last question for you before I let sure. you off the book. And that's just, just give me a, give me a brief statement on, on what next steps might look like where uh, I guess next steps on the path to, to clinic perhaps. Yeah. Well, this is a, a super exciting year for us because the, the most advanced product in our portfolio, our, our lead asset, our legacy asset, the one I've been speaking a lot about, 
is expected to uh, enter clinical development in 2022. We expect, if everything goes well, to uh, submit our IND on, on, on CTA, which is the IND equivalent in Europe, in, uh, let's say, uh, Q3, end of Q3 of 2022, and start enrolling patients in 2022. So this is super exciting. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> obviously, the main, um, the main catalyst for us in 2022. And, and then, of course, the, the rest of the portfolio is expected to, uh, to progress as, um, as expected. Yeah, excellent. Well, we wish you luck on that path, Stefan. I, I appreciate the time that you've given us and sharing some insight and, uh, and advice with our, with our audience. So thank you very much for joining us. We'll be paying attention, and hopefully we'll have the opportunity to, to connect again soon. Thank you, Matt. And thank you for having me today. It was a real pleasure. Take care. You too. Bye-bye. That's Bearing Vision CEO and President Stefan Bossel. I'm Matt Piller, and this is the Business of Biotech. We're produced by Bioprocess Online in partnership with Cytiva, which demonstrates its commitment to the emerging biopharma's journey at cytiva.com backslash emerging biotech. Check that out. Check us out at bioprocessonline.com, where you can sign up for my newsletter. And if you're enjoying the business of biotech, subscribe, leave us some feedback. And as always, thanks for listening.